some that is meant to cause peace. So I think that that in his infinite wisdom, God will put on your heart what he wants you to do in your lane. Yeah, definitely. And what do you think, Mbala? Because like I said, you come from the country of Cameroon, and I imagine that your dad being a, um ambassador probably influenced some of what you do, even on the musical side. So you probably feel in your case that you are uh, been kind of trained to incorporate some of those elements in your music based on who your dad was. Um, you know, I think that I thought that too, when I started, um, that, that was what I believed. And then I just felt like everything felt better when, um, I was creating the music that was, um, you know, like you said, just truest to who I am. Um, and I mean, I'm going to borrow from, from Nina Simone here. I know she had, um, a, a quote that, that spoke to me and she said, it's an artist's duty to reflect the times." So with that being said, I still feel like, you know, uh, to reflect your perspective of the time. And I think that that's also, that's, that's relative, you know, for everybody, you know, somebody, there could be so many things going on at one time and everybody could be experiencing a different part of it. Um, so, you know, your choice to, um, talk about, um, you know, love in a certain time, um, maybe, you know, uh, uh, like, you know, it, as opposed to somebody else talking, you know, having like a political messages because that's what affects, it's affecting them in this time. I don't think that those things are, um, mutually exclusive or cancel each other out or make either, either, you know, less important than the other. And one of the other things I'm curious about from both of you, and actually the, we actually played a spot before about um, a guy that uh, is definitely a friend of this show and everything, but he talks about smooth jazz. And I know that Larry is a big fan of what he considers straight ahead jazz. And within the hip hop movement, there is also the different divisions and everything. And I was wondering as both of you as musicians, how do you address this? Because I know sometimes people get, in my opinion, too caught up in the divisions of whatever the musical form is, whether it's smooth versus straight ahead, whether it's um, standard hip hop versus uh, non-standard, for lack of a better term, or West Coast versus East Coast. And I was just wondering, as performers yourselves, how do you avoid these kind of, what, in my mind, seems to be artificial kind of divisions that the media or whoever wants to create? Ladies first. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I want to think about that. Um, I don't think that I make it a point to um, avoid anything. I think that uh, I'm I'm fortunate to be part of a generation that is creating so many lanes and embracing so many lanes. Um, I'm fortunate to have the perspective of the most important thing being authentic to be is being authentic to myself. So um, I just create and whatever comes of that comes of that. And I think that by just being naturally such like, like a a multifaceted multicultural person, um, anyone would be hard pressed to try to put me in a box. Um, So, yeah. And what would you add to that, John? My thoughts on the topic are are pretty complicated, to be honest. Uh, I was raised as kind of an elitist, uh, and this is my word, an elitist jazz musician, because when I was coming up in the music, I was around some people who I won't name, but everybody knows who they are, uh, who set me on a course of where I should listen and how I should view music that uh, was not consistent with what they thought I should listen to and what I what they thought I should view as being credible. Um, where I land on that now is that I, I, I am a proponent of anyone who takes music seriously, takes what they're doing seriously, takes their craft seriously, and studies, studies it. Um, that is, there are some people, and I mean, just to get directed to the point that I believe you're getting at, there are some people who will listen to smooth jazz who might mention any number of smooth jazz artist names as among their favorites, but they don't know who John Coltrane is. They don't know who Cannonball Adderley is. They don't know who Charles Mingus is. So for me, the, perhaps this is where I sit as a performer, 
and as an educator, but for me, the problem lies there. No one should ever allow, and I hate to use him because he just is always his name always comes up, but I mean it is what it is. I no one should ever say to me anything about a Kenny G one way or another unless they can also tell me the name of one John Coltrane recording. So for me, I believe that that where we are as artists and musicians and as a society, like what you like, I, I will never make a judgment about what somebody says he or she likes. I believe in being exposed to all the things from which you might choose before you land on that. And I believe that uh, perhaps it's a part of my mission to create a society where uh, if, if people do decide they want to listen to one kind of music or another, they're at least informed about how that music got here. And I think that's one of the things that, um, even coming back to what we talked about earlier with education, I wonder even in our school system if we're doing enough of a good enough job in that, because I don't know, at least on the grade level, not on the college level, but on the grade school level, if we're having enough people understand the history of music. Like, if, if they're fans of an artist in the hip-hop genre, if they're a fan of somebody in country, if they're a fan of somebody in rock, if they're a fan of somebody in jazz, if they don't understand the history of of where that music came from and the history of how the musics are interrelated. I mean, even hip hop has had a number, as I've alluded to, jazz artists that they sampled off of, and they and mm-hmm. most of the good ones will admit, and most of the good ones will admit that. Will admit it. That's right. That's exactly yeah. right. Um, so I just it, go ahead. Go ahead, Invala. No, I was going to say in uh, response to you, you know, asking if schools are doing um, a good job of that. I, I mean, I don't know that I can speak to that. I would say maybe that my school did not, um, but music was an elective at my school. Um, but just pulling in a, a quote from, from Quincy Jones that I thought was really poignant to me was that, you know, you've got to learn to respect the gift that, that God gave you by studying your craft. Um, so I think that the moment that you decide to do something um, and, that, and that your goal is to uh, improve there has to be some studying associated with that. Definitely. And Impala, like you said, you've been fairly new to the music scene here. John has been here for a number of years, but just uh, we talked earlier before you gave on the call and everything, but what has been your impression of the music scene here in Durham in particular, but the triangle in general? I mean, I know there are a number of places that are allowing young musicians to play, whether it's someplace like a pinhook or a motorco or um, some of the other venues that are out there. Like I mentioned sharp nine earlier, this more of a jazz kind of venue, but just as a young up and coming musician, what is your views of the music scene locally? Mm. I think that the music scene is very, very, very rich in uh, talent. Um, I think that, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of learning how to uh, support one another and how to um, help one another r- reach, um, I guess, more, a, a greater audience. I think that uh, it gets very, very tense when, you know, everybody knows that they're talented and wants to be seen and uh, it it does turn into kind of a crabs in the barrel mentality, which, you know, as we all know, just, you know, holds you back a little bit more. I think that with a little bit more, um, uh, uh, if, with a little bit more motivation to explore all the other roles of the industry and all the ways that we can support one another, I think that the scene could really, really um, see a lot, a lot of success. And, John, uh, she actually brings up some good points because I know that in the past I've had people that have been part of, say, different charrettes and things where they've talked about the art scene in general, and then there's been some great networking and some great opportunities for people to connect, but then there doesn't seem to be enough follow-through in my mind. And I was just wondering if you think that that's true. And then the other thing that I know I've heard people complain about um, is the fact that to some degree some of our festivals – get stuck on certain artists and certain artists only. So like the meaning that they bring in the same artists on a routine basis, or if they bring in even national acts, they bring in some of the, the same ones. And then that leaves other people out. And then even on the radio side, I know that that's one of the big industry charges is that a lot of times our local artists 
are not as supported as they should be by some of our big radio stations. So I know that's a whole lot of things to unearth and unravel and everything, but I just wanted your assessment of some of these. And, of course, I'll hear more from Mbala as well. Well, I think that there is enough going on in Durham in particular and uh, even more when you expand that to the triangle that there's an opportunity that could be presented for anybody. Uh, Durham has kind of been a, a place where musicians and artists and creative people gather. And, uh, you know, we we're talking about responsibility a second ago. And I think that there is a conversation to be had for people who are presenting one form of art or another to be inclusive, to honor what their vision is for what the, that thing that they are starting and, of course, that thing that, that they are most likely funding. Uh, but I think that some responsibility is, uh, is, is required for at least being aware of who's right here under your nose, who is helping create the audience that is going to support your festival, helping develop that audience who is going to appreciate the people you bring uh, because – you know, in, in many instances, it is those people who are helping to sustain the uh, the environment that creates those people who are going to come and pay bigger tickets for a national act. I, I think that there's a lot that can be done to support who's here uh, locally, regionally, in addition to uh, who one might bring in nationally. And, yeah, as far as the repeated people coming, you know, that the presenting side is a unique and a different animal all its own. I'd simply say from an artist's perspective, knowing what we all do, the sacrifices that we all make, and the commitments that we all make to where we live, that I think that that should at least be in the conversation when presenters are going about doing what, whatever it is that they do. Because one of the things that still amazes me, and uh, I'm curious to hear from both of you about this, is I'm uh, still amazed sometimes at the uh, how can I put it? The lack of respect sometimes that some of our presenters, not all of them, but some of them give to the artists in general. Like they will want the artists to come and bring an audience with them, whether that's being associated with Duke, whether that's being somebody unique like yourself, Mbala. But then they will be wanting to pay pennies. Mm. <laughs> Is that to me? For both of you, I will yield. Imbala? Um, um, you know, I think that in the same way that we are talking about the importance of um, doing your research and studying your craft, um, I think we can have the same conversation about studying the industry that you're going into. Um, and so that goes for all the people who um, are in positions where um, – you know, they, they, they would like to be supporting local artists, um, you know. So if you're putting on a show and, you know, you need a, a, a promoter, understanding what the role of the promoter is, et cetera, you know, understanding how to, you know, monetize the event, calculate the, you know, the capacity, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and set um, goals for yourself in terms of revenue so that you can, you can pay the artist, um, so I think I think there's just there, there's so much to be said about the supporting roles and and um, the effort and the knowledge that needs to go into to, into those to be able to really create the, the the ecosystem that we would all love. I don't it's think definitely. it's necessary for I don't think it's necessarily for lack of um, uh, a desire to do that. I do think that it's more for lack of um, expertise or or research. And I would agree with that. And that's something that even I think you would agree with, John, is that sometimes I wonder whether enough of our people that are wanting to get into these fields have done enough research in terms of like just learning basic things. Like I said, I know that there are continuing education courses at Duke. There are continuing education courses at Durham Tech, even at Central, I believe. But I sometimes wonder if everybody sees the glamour 
of the music industry and automatically wants to get involved with it without necessarily doing the research. No matter what people may think of where Art of Cool is now, that is the one thing I will give Al and Cicely credit for when they first created it, was they seem to have done some serious, and part of that was Cicely's background, they seem to have done some serious market research 